Good morning, and welcome to Moments with Melinda. I am so glad to have you with us today. And my guest is Jim Wilson. Hi, Jim. Good morning, Melinda. And that's Jim spelled with a Y. That's correct. Yes. Let me tell my viewers a little bit about you, Jim. Jim Wilson is a photographer, journalist, photo editor, consultant, and instructor. His career and commitment to journalism is built around photography. He honed his skills as a staff photographer at the largest daily newspaper in Vermont, and then worked as the sole staff photographer at Gannett News Service, covering a wide assortment of assignments in Washington, D.C. and around the world. He moved to USA Today and developed a reputation as a photographer's photo editor. Right? And now you're yeah, now, you're, now, now you're with the, the standard in 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 Missouri, right? It's actually the Springfield Daily Citizen, Daily Citizen. and I am a contract freelancer. I'm not on staff. But you've written some incredible pieces because I've been reading them. So, Jim, um, let's start at the beginning. Let's tell our viewers a little bit about you and share with us a snapshot of your early childhood. Sure. Well. Um, I grew up in South Burlington, uh, went to South Burlington schools, um, started working, learning about photography when I was in high school. Um, I think some of my earlier visual experiences were be, uh, based on childhood trips uh, on weekends. Dad would just say, let's go for a ride. And we'd take off in the car. There'd be the five of us. And I was just always looking out the window and by the time I had my first camera, I was taking the drives on my own, and that ultimately led me to the free press. So, um, so what and who, what and whom inspired you to pursue a photojournalism career? Well, I think that I was affected. My earliest uh, impressions of photography were because of Life magazine. Um, we got the magazine at home. It was a weekly back then. Um, it was probably the largest weekly print magazine in the United States. Um, and their focus um, was worldwide, uh, but they did a lot with politics, with pop culture, with the space race, of course, um, and issues of race. Um, and they just had a tremendous photo staff. So I was seeing their work very early. Um, and by the time I was in high school, I was looking for specific photographers to to sort of learn from. So who got um, you your, who got you your first camera? And what was it? Uh, my first camera is actually right around the right across the room from me. It was a Kodak Retina 1A. Um, I actually found it, <laughs> um, it, which is a long story in and of itself. Um, it's a 35 millimeter um, film camera uh, that you guess the distance, you didn't have a meter built in. Um, and I joined the camera club at South Brunton High School to get the basics going. Um, I was one of those kids, um, you know, also worked in the AV department for a year or two. Um, and I also was going to, I, I took two courses through the Church Street Center. Um, I don't know if the Church Street Center even exists anymore, um, but they had a night course, Photography 1, Photography 2, that was taught by um, a man named Jonathan Terry, who had a studio downtown on Church Street. Um, and Jonathan let me hang around um, after we got to know each other a little bit. Um, and I learned the the fundamentals from him, the, you know, the how aperture worked, how uh, the, you know, how the aperture and shutter speed were related, things like that. Um, so, so how photography has changed from those days to today, right? That's very true, but at the same time, I believe that you need to know the basics. And yeah. a lot of um, film is making a little bit of a comeback. Um, if you're if you're into interested in photography in high school, chances are there's a dark room for you to learn in. Absolutely, um, yeah. and and you're probably still using your your thirty five millimeter. Right? Um, I actually bought a thirty five millimeter film camera that's similar to my first professional camera. Um, I bought a used one earlier this year. I haven't had a chance to use it yet, um, but I, I fully intend to. But I am a, uh, a a mirrorless camera guy now. Wonderful. Still a Nikon guy. So, so now um, you are a Vermonter, born and bred. 
So yes. talk to us about some of the defining moments in Vermont's history that you covered early on in your career at the Burlington Free Press. Well, <laughs> my my career at the Free Press sort of started with a bang um, in that I, I, I was hired as a two day a week lab technician. My first day was a Sunday. Um, the Strong Theater had burned down the Friday before. Three people died. That also took the Black Cat restaurant down. Um, I came into work. The The guy who I was replacing, he was actually becoming full-time. I was part-time. Um, he and I walked over to the scene. It was just around the corner from the Free Press. Uh, we got up to the to the police line. Tim showed his, uh, his press ID. The cop said, come on in, looked at me, said, who's he? Tim said, he's with us. Uh, and I was hooked because the cop just waved me in. Um, so that was sort of the beginning of it all. I mean, I just like, hey, I can go places other people can't. Um, some of the earliest memories are uh, Patrick Leahy's first re-election to the Senate. Um, I managed to talk my way into his hotel room, made a really nice photo of his family, him and his family. Um, of course, uh, Bernie Sanders' first election in 1981 to mayor was a, a big, big moment. Uh, the Amtrak derailment, uh, Island Pond, and then um, stories that I either initiated or um, helped promote um, into, into existence, uh, like a three-week trip to Yaroslavl, Burlington Sister City, um, in 19... 89 or 90, something like that, just before the Soviet Union became Russia. Um, and Molly Walsh and I spent three weeks with Circus Mercus kids uh, in Russia, and that was a big deal. And, you know, it, it, Burlington, the, the free press had a circulation that was bigger than the population of Burlington. I think our circulation at its peak was about 65,000 on Sundays, and Burlington was about 45,000 populations. So, I always told my coworkers, the photographers that I work with, that I sort of felt like we were the eyes of for Vermont. You know, we were the, we again, we could go places that that most of our readers didn't go or couldn't go. That's so true, and we all remember those pieces with J Y M Wilson right there. You know, with your with your incredible work. I mean, yeah. and that that's a total. Jim, JYM is a total affectation. Uh, there was a, a, a photographer at the Free Press named James Wilson. When I was still in high school, he came up from Indiana um, to run the photo department and sort of modernize it. And I saw it and said, well, that'll never do. And I started spelling it JYM. And well, we he, actually hired, he actually hired me. Oh, fantastic. Well, you know, we remember your work. We well, followed you. your work um, and your whole career, your adult life. Yeah. So, um, so talk to us about, you know, expanding beyond, I guess, Vermont. Talk to us about some of the standout assignments that really affected you, whether it was nationally, internationally, or locally. Talk sure. to us about a couple of those stories, because you have some incredible stories, Jim. So please share that with my viewers. Well, when I moved to D.C., I was working for Gannett News Service, and our sort of bread and butter was what we called specials um, for papers. Say the Burlington Free Press would say, Pat Leahy is running a hearing. We want photos of him. Or Ben and Jerry are receiving an award from President Clinton. We need a photo from that. So I would do that sort of thing. But we also did big projects. And probably my favorite was a project that uh, I worked on with a reporter named Ellen Hale uh, on uh, women's health issues and world uh, population trends. And we spent, uh, gosh, I think it was five weeks, uh, two in China, then three in India, came back to the States for about a month, and then we went to Mexico for three more weeks. And those were photos that made a big difference. People would see some of those photos and reach out to find out how could they help in places like India where healthcare wasn't that that great for, for women. Um, I often point to one particular photo and say, um, that was taken on one of my, the best days of my life because we were in a village of Dalit who uh, at one time were called the untouchables. Um, but the Dalit let us in and we walked down to a little river with all the women in the village. There was our translator and, and, and uh, I were the only men. And the women told us about, you know, being a woman in a village like this and the type of healthcare we had. And it was a remarkable gift um, to be allowed to, to, meet those women and, and go come back to the States and tell their story. So that one really, really stands out. Then there were sort of little things like witnessing 
Bill Clinton's second inauguration, you know, seeing the peaceful transfer of power or the peaceful transition of his first administration to his second, um, especially when you think about now, um, was very moving and at the same time, very, very cold. <laughs> it was about uh, 10 or 15 degrees. Um, and I was uh, on a riser right behind uh, right behind the, the, the place where he was going to be sworn in. Amazing. Amazing. I mean, you've lived an incredible life. You've lived many lives. In this well, it, it's been, a, it, it's been a, a pleasure. It's been an honor. And I look around at some of my colleagues and think, well, they're the ones that really have, ha have had the experiences. Oh, you know, you always you. you always wish that you could have done a little bit more. And that's, I think, one of the reasons why I'm doing community journalism here in Springfield um, is to try to be able to continue to tell stories. Thank you for that, Jim. So um, I'm going to move on to something that I read about you. You're writing or are in the have written a screenplay for a major motion picture. Now, I know that you and Stephen Kiernan, who we both absolutely adore, Stephen, right? Sure. Wrote a screenplay about the 50 ton. I didn't realize it was 50 ton. I mean, 50 pounds would have been a lot, but 50 yeah. ton. I mean, come on, man. 50 ton hash bust carried out by 31 Vermonters smuggling the hash into Canada way back when, I'm not sure of the year. Is this the movie that you and Steven have been working on? Yeah, and it was 13 Vermonters. It wasn't 31. Oh, they were a big group, 13. but they, it, wasn't, it wasn't like a gang. Oh, um, so many of us but, would have been there, though. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't remember the exact year. I want to say 91, but I'm not sure. Um, when I left USA Today in uh, 2015, I had been talking about writing the screenplay for years. That pretty much um, as soon as Stephanie Carter, the reporter, and I got back from Satil, Quebec, um, where the bus took place, um, I said, oh, this would be a great movie. And finally, I mean, enough people had heard me say it that they said, now you have the time because I left USA Today and I had a year or two where I wasn't going to, didn't have any plans. So I took a couple of screenwriting workshops, learned the basics of the software, um, connected with Steven, connected with uh, a couple of other people in Vermont and just sat down and I wrote the first draft. Um, Steven and a couple of other folks uh, looked at it sent it back to me. I worked on it again. Then Stephen took a shot at it, cleaned it up a little bit more. It's registered. It's out there. If anybody's interested in producing it, they can just contact me. We'd be happy to sell it to them. What a great it's story. Forever. And, you know, and nowadays it would be a really fascinating story. So yeah. And, you know, I met two of the principals and it was interesting. Uh, Billy Greer and a guy named Steve Hutchins, who I understand passed away a couple of years ago. Um, we, Mike Donahue and I did a jailhouse interview with them uh, after the bust. And then when I was working on the story uh, or on the script, uh, I came up to Vermont to do a little bit more research. And I had breakfast with Hutch and we drove around town for a while. I talked with Billy briefly. We were never able to really sit down, um, but it was very interesting to see those guys all those years later. And I had heard here and there that it was actually a hundred tons, but only 50 tons made it to shore. Um, it, it, I mean, it's just, it's such a complex it's story. Mind -boggling. It's mind-boggling. We could spend a full 30 minutes on it. Absolutely. But, but now it's, but now it's legal here in Vermont. And, and what a shame that all those Indeed. years that, yeah. that so, I mean, many, both, so many of our generation ended up in yeah. prison and had yeah. to suffer the ills of, um, of, of that horrible, um, you know, policy that was there that put us all in jail, a lot of people in jail. So let's move on to backstage at the Oscars. I was kind sure. of fascinated about that when I read that. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, um, one of my roles at USA Today was photo editor, um, and I was the lead entertainment photo editor. And in the live section, over the time that I was there, we had anywhere between three and five photo editors on the desk. Um, but after the woman who ran the desk left, I, I took over the lead and I'd already done a couple of small award shows. And so uh, the Oscars fell to me. Um, I did the Oscars 15 years in a row. What it really means is you've got a tux on and it's all very formal and you're in a little tiny room editing photos. You're in, a, in the hotel, the show is taking place sort of down the hall and around the corner type of thing. Um, you know, 
I would occasionally go into uh, what was then called the photo room because we weren't digitally connected um, to the photographers to pick up discs to bring back for more editing. Very, very exciting. I would run a team of about four or five photographers um, and also work with the reporters. Uh, I produced a couple of videos where I would interview re our reporters about, you know, their predictions for who was going to win, stuff like that. We just were so trying cool. to do about anything. The big, the big accomplishment was actually getting one of our staff photographers backstage for about five years in a row. Um, and still probably one of my bigger accomplishments um, in, in entertainment photography. Wow, because you have an online photo gallery. And I don't know where that is online, but you have an online photo gallery that grew out of a two-page print photo spread that was called the Academy Awards Best Picture Winners Through the Years. How do my viewers see that? Oh, well, <laughs> okay. I know what you're you referring need a to. Website. You need a website. Yeah, that one, unfortunately probably doesn't exist anymore. That was something I did for USA Today um, where I just thought it would be interesting. There was some sort of peg. It was like the 75th anniversary or the 50th anniversary or something. Um, and I gathered photos of every single winner for those years, uh, worked with a reporter to write a little like two sentence blurb about that. And it was an online gallery. And we also did it as a double truck in print. Um, USA Today, today, unfortunately, has shown very little concern about their past. So lots and lots of work just disappeared as the, as the website changed. You did write a piece for USA Today in 2023 called Taylor Swift Before Superstardom, a photographer's memories from an NFL stadium. So you met Miss Swift. So talk to us about this and her rise to be a force in this political election. How cool that you got to meet her. Sure. That was actually for the Springfield Daily Citizen. It wasn't for USA Today, okay, but it was about you. some of my experiences at USA Today. Um, and just as an aside, that story still holds the record for the most views for any story to ever appear in the Springfield Daily Citizen. It, it like crossed into the 150,000 range or something within within a few days. Um, it, it truly went viral. Um, and my viewers can see it, can read it online. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. If they go to Springfield, uh, sgfcitizen.org uh, and then search Taylor Swift or search for my name, they'll find it. Um, but Taylor was at the Country Music Awards a couple of times. We photographed her. Um, it, we would construct this little studio in the locker room and, and she would come down uh, and be photographed. She was lovely. We first met her when she was 17. A few years later, she had, I think it was either her third or fourth album was about to come out. Her publicist approached us about doing a one hour photo session with her. Most of our photo sessions in Nashville at the, um, it was actually at what was called the fanfare at the time. It was a big three day festival. Uh, our photos were taken in the basement uh, or the sort of the bowels of the uh, LP stadium in Nashville. But her, she was not performing that year, but her publicist said, hey, we'd love for you guys to have an hour with her. I love and it. And she came in. She was actually there early, very small group of people with her, her publicist, her mom, who travels with her everywhere, hair and makeup person, wardrobe person, and a security person. So there was like six people on her. And one of the first things she did was walked over. I had a little laptop set up. Um, and I had an iPod plugged into it. And she started scrolling through my iPod. And she looked at me and said, you're a deep track guy, aren't you? And I said, yeah. And she said, okay, so I get to be DJ today. And I said, go for it. So she chose the music through the entire, uh, you know, and it was about an hour. And she, I she love really it. was, yeah, she was lovely. That's and, so, and so Yeah, I'm so glad for her, for her success and, and the person that she seems to be. She's so lovely. Hey, Jim, what took you to Springfield, Missouri? where you now write as a photojournalist for the Springfield Daily Citizen, which actually opened in 2022. Talk to yeah. what, what brought you to Springfield? We drove. No, no, but but why? What, what, what? Uh, so I took a buyout. I took a buyout from USA Today in 2015. I was certain that with my experience, uh, I would get a job quickly. Within two years, I knew that I was not gonna get a job quickly. I worked at a hardware store for a couple of years. Um, the woman that I live with lost her job, um, which was in the cable industry, cable television industry and education sort of combined. Um, 
neither of us got jobs. The cats wouldn't get jobs. The house's mortgage wouldn't pay itself. So she has family here and we had been several times. So, you know, it just it, it turned out to be the place we could live the least expensively um, <laughs> after living in DC for 26 years. Wow. And look what you're doing. So, and you're working for a local newspaper, which we're going to get to that in a second. But I, I have to have you talk to my viewers about a story you wrote in February of this year about Riley Hesterly, a five foot two, sixth man. I don't know what that means, but sixth man for the Missouri State Bears basketball team. It is such a heartwarming and it brought me to tears. I'll just share quickly a little bit about that story about Riley Hesterly. Would you, Jim? Sure. Well, uh, reporter Lyndall Scranton and I were working on a year-long um, package of stories that ran after the basketball season. Um, we had exclusive behind-the-scenes access, locker room access. And so I was going to a lot of the practices, all the, all the home games. We went to uh, at least one road game. And Riley is a young man with Down syndrome. Um, and by six man, the basketball team is made up of five. And he is like, has a uniform and he's not a student there. He has a couple of jobs, uh, including a small business of his own. Um, and um, he was just always under the basket during warmups. And he'd, you know, catch rebounds, toss the ball out to players. The players would high five him. Um, and I just, you know, who is this kid and what's the deal? And I just sort of looked into that a little bit more. People with guns um, have, always been a great interest to me. Um, I had an aunt uh, with Downs uh, who died when I was very, very young. I only met her a few times, um, but it always, because of my interactions with her, um, and I actually did a similar story in, in Vermont a long, long time ago um, about a young woman who was a page uh, at the state capitol. Um, anyway, Riley was, is a great, great young man, and the players really love him. And so, so, so for my viewers, you know, to to see to read any of of uh, Jim's, um, you know, journalism and to see his photography, just just Google J Y M Wilson, and you will see his work, and you can read his stories. And I suggest you do that, but I do think you need a website. Um, so now, listen, let's move into. We have a little few more, a little bit more time left. Are you concerned about the fact that local newspapers are being taken over by large publishing conglomerates and that local news is not shared the way it used to be? Well, large conglomerates have been taking over local newspapers for decades. You know, the Burlington Free Press is a Gannett paper. It was purchased um, from the McClure family by Gannett, I think, in the mid 70s, I was in high school and had a paper route actually um, and w and delivered the free press. Um, what really is of, of greater concern is just the death of local newspapers, period. Right here, um, period. You know, and and the outlet that I work for is online only. Um, we are a nonprofit. We're similar to the Vermont Digger that way. Um, and um, it's it's really it's the future of journalism. Print is to me, print is as dead as the paper that it's printed on. The trees that the you know paper comes from, um, just unfortunately because of the ex, uh, of the expense of printing. Um, I love the tactile experience of reading a newspaper. When we moved here, it was the first time in my adult life that I did not have a print subscription. Um, we went entirely online with the New York Times and the Washington Post. Um, but local journalism, community journalism is extremely important. You need those watchdog journalists telling you that your, you know, members of your city council are on the take or that your mayor is doing a great job or, you know, that the principal of a, one of your local schools is one of the best educators in the country. Um, I always like to tell people that the great thing about working in journalism is that you meet people who are really good at what you do. You don't write very many stories about people who are really bad at what they do um, outside of the court system. Um, so, you know, bringing light to those sorts of stories is key to me. Absolutely. Well, you know, but but large conglomerates are taking over, certainly in the radio business, in the television business. Um, and I know in, in print media that they're coming in and then they're going national. I mean, even USA Today now um, is, you know, is is part of the Burlington Free Press. But anyway, neither here nor there. So you must be horrified by the lack of truth that's coming out of what was once trusted news. Uh, what's happened to truth in reporting? 
I'm horrified by some of the outlets that provide that news. I, I think that there are more bad sources of information and it's it, it's incumbent on news consumers to find outlets that they truly can believe and trust. I don't think that there are very many journalists that go to work every day saying, how can I tell a lie to get on the front page? Right. Um, you know, there's a new book that's coming out next week by Bob Wood, uh, Woodward from the Washington Post about Trump's involvement with uh, with Vladimir Putin over the last, since, since Trump left office. Um, and, you know, that information's out there. Now, undoubtedly, there are news outlets that are gonna take that and go, well, where's the proof? And what does that mean? You know, lots and lots of, of former presidents would have had contact with Russian leaders. And that may be true. Um, but in this particular case, it probably has a, a more sinister meaning. But again, it's really, I mean, it's, it's not a one-way street. Journalists are out there investigating, writing, reporting. Um, readers can't just blindly accept things as truth. They have to, you know, consider the source. Well, they do. And... You know, just the, to this morning, the Wall Street Journal had an opinion piece by J.D. Vance, you know, backing up their ridiculous untruth claims about the response uh, with uh, by FEMA and the Biden administration and using people suffering for a political ploy. And the Wall Street Journal print, printed that. And it's a lie. So it's really scary. But then what would you expect from Murdoch? So here we go. Yeah. Let's go back to this. So, um if you had any wisdom to share with our youth today, what would it be, Jim? Um, look up, look down, look all around. <laughs> I, I, I speak to photo classes every now and then, and that's sort of been my mantra is look up, look down, look all around. What does um, that mean? What does that mean? It means that, um, truly, yeah, I mean, you don't even have to look up and down because if you're looking all around, you're doing the, the first two. Um, it just means keep your eyes open, be, a, you know, listen. Um, if you're a journalist, you're, you are not the story. You have to be, you know, behind the scenes most of the time. Now there are times like the Taylor Swift story column, that was a first person column. Um, but that's very unusual for me to write something like that. Um, and I just think that the, you know, the Washington Post motto, they printed above the fold every single day is democracy dies in darkness. And that's very, very true. Um, you know, there's a there are po politicians out there that think that the press should be shut down or should be monitored by the government. You know, that's fascism. So, so how are you looking out to the future of our country come November second? I'm November fifth. I'm sorry. What are you thinking? What uh, I have my financial advisor on speed dial. Um, <laughs> you know. I, I really find it hard to imagine uh, former President Trump being reelected, but I live in a very, very red state and I see a lot of Trump signs. I was just in North Carolina for, for two weeks. I saw a lot of Trump signs there. Um, I just have to hope that over the next four weeks, because the election is four weeks from yesterday, I hope that over the next four weeks that people really, really pay attention that the vote turns out in those key states. And I also, really believe that after three elections in a row, I think that Congress really needs to look at the Electoral College and say that this thing is just uh, part of the past. It needs to be replaced. You, you know, you've got people being elected to office who didn't receive the majority of the vote. Absolutely. And that, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Well, fingers crossed. Yeah. We're working very hard uh, to protect our democracy. So, you know, your photography and your writing uh, is magnificent. You have carved out an important place in the world of photojournalism. You speak from your heart, you write with truth in your soul, and your photographs are truly inspirational. So, Jim, I want to thank you for your contributions and for your indomitable spirit to bring truthful news to our lives. And I hope when you come back, if you come back to Vermont, I would love to go out to lunch with you and continue this conversation because you have yeah. so much to share. Yeah. And wow. by the way, come back to Vermont and do an exhibit. We'd yeah. love to get you in, in one of our galleries back here and yeah. have a great opening. So all of your old fabulous friends who love you can yeah. come and see you again and put their, our arms around you. Thank you for all you've done. 
Well, you're most welcome. And it's it's truly been a pleasure. It's been a great way to spend the last 45 years. And I, I, I've i got to get back to Vermont. Um, I, I miss it terribly. I miss my friends there. This is my favorite time of year. I know it's a cliche, but I think that fall and spring, there's just nothing like it in Vermont um, for me personally. Um, and my 50th high school reunion is in 2026. So at the very latest, I got to get back there for that. I've got friends to see. Well, when you do, I'm on speed dial. Yeah. I, would love to, I would love to take you to lunch and continue this conversation. So thank you, sir, for your time and to the viewers. Um, happy, beautiful autumn. And yes. wish you all a beautiful day, a beautiful sunny day. And I will see you soon. Be well. Thank you. Bye-bye.